This evening's reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, and beginning to read at verse 20. John's Gospel, chapter 17, beginning to read at verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce and to welcome Joel Edwards, the General Directory, uh, Director of the Evangelical Alliance. Actually, he's a man of many parts, so Directory, Director, all things. Joel um, has a very uh, important ministry on our behalf as Evangelical Christians. I often find myself reading the newspaper and reading some article about some particular moral issue or situation in our country. and feeling to myself, if only somebody would say something a little bit further down the article, Joel Edwards, director of the Evangelical Alliance, responds. And so uh, we want to say to Joel that we continue to pray for you in the very, very vital ministry of representing us and uh, seeking to mobilize us as uh, Christians within this land. And Joel, I wonder if you'd come and join me. I'd like to pray for you as you bring God's word to us this evening. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Joel. Thank you for the ministry that you've entrusted to him and for his faithfulness in seeking to honor you and to draw your people together. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless Joel this evening. May your word be his words. And may he speak from you to us. Give us, we pray, listening ears and responsive hearts. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. Thank you very much, Keith. I'm afraid my title tends to uh, get uh, chopped and changed quite a bit. I haven't quite managed the directory before, but I'll, I'll, work, I'll work on it. You've given me some thoughts, some food for thought there. The word is that I'm called general director because they couldn't find a specific one. So uh, there you go. It is a privilege to uh, stand before you to share God's word, and particularly given the ethos of this great convention, All One in Christ Jesus, uh, which is obviously a theme which uh, goes very deep in my own heart, my life, and for these last 10, 12 years or so, the ministry to which I believe God has called me. I hope our journey together uh, in the word is something which consolidates what this convention theme has been about for so many years and I hope what it does for each of us is to help us along in that journey I'm sure God 
is taking all of us through. The uh, year began with a rather uh, sad note for me relatively early in the year, a man called Justin Phillips, a great servant of God who worked at the BBC, died. I was with others as we sat on the balcony of his local church in Ealing and heard a celebration of his life uh, while the service was going on. The thing which kept going through my mind was the very last communication I'd had with Justin. Well, it was a kind of a communication. What had actually happened was that we left a series of voicemail messages for about two weeks. You know how that kind of thing can happen. The very last message I got from him was something like, Joel, Justin here, sorry we've missed each other again. Uh, never mind, uh, I'm off for the Christmas now. Hope you have a brilliant Christmas and New Year. Talk to you next year. And that kept going over and over in my mind as I sat with family and friends and those who came from different parts of the world to celebrate this man's life. Uh, something very poignant, isn't there, about final words, about farewells. And you may have your own personalized experience of that. Perhaps someone with whom you had a very close walk, maybe a friend, a partner, a member of your local fellowship. Uh, and you'll remember from time to time just how significant, how, how important those final words have been to you. What we have recorded in John 17 may be numbered amongst the significant things Jesus said for a number of reasons. One is that it's what's regarded as his priestly prayer. He is tapping into God. He is tapping in to heaven and he is pouring out from himself the heartbeat of God for the 12 as they would have been but more importantly for those who will become an extended part of this small family of God with him for three and a half years. But it's important too because this is probably his final magisterial prayer. I think if one reads the context of John 17, moving in from chapters 14, 15, 16 into 17, you cannot help but be fairly convinced that this is probably John's equivalent to the Gethsemane prayer. The chronology is the same as that which Matthew records leading up to Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22. There is a poignancy, there is a urgency, there is an intensity, there is a graciousness about this prayer. No, we don't have a record of sweat becoming drops of blood, but we have a sense of a poignancy which fits perfectly into the chronology of the Synoptic Gospels. And after Jesus said this, verse 1 of chapter 17, he looked towards heaven and prayed. I like to truncate that. And after Jesus said this, he prayed. He just had a discourse with the disciples. He is now moving in the presence of God on our behalf. And if that's the case, then it's got to be important and it must be something we pay very special attention to. It's a brilliant prayer, and you and I will be fairly familiar with it, I guess. The part we have honed in on is captured in my Bible. Jesus prays for all believers. Was it Packer who once spoke about God's cosmic generosity? There is a generosity in this prayer which we probably take for granted and which we are probably fairly blasé about all these years later. But I imagine if the disciples had overheard anything of this very important prayer or having had it conveyed to them at a later stage, reflected deeply on it, they would have been quite nonplussed by some of the things Jesus was saying to God about them in this prayer. Because in the first instance, he's asking that God would take them beyond their comfort zone. My prayer is not for them alone, but for all those who will believe 
in me. That's the way God does it. Just when you thought you were in an exclusive party and you had God all to yourself, he spins a number like this and he's praying for those beyond our comfort zone. I'm not just praying for these men alone. I am praying for those who are yet to be a part of this family of faith. And it seems to me that what God does best, sometimes at the most inconsiderate time, is to push us out of the comfort zones in which we have found ourselves as the people of God. I think we get comfortable for a whole range of reasons. One of those is that we have locked ourselves into some kind of doctrine of precedence. We are comfortable because we have been here first. You know? It's probably the syndrome which gets to all of us at that point, where we look at the policeman and you think, he looks so young. <laughs> the inference really is, he can't arrest me. The inference is, he can't actually exercise any authority over me. This could be my boy. The inference is, I have been around the block a little longer than you, lad, so just be careful how you address me. If emotionally, I even want you to address me. Think of that towards, uh, in terms of the world of church. Because very often, isn't it true that those of us who have been around the longest find it hard to accept others in because there is a kind of a subconscious, unwritten code of precedence which says the longer you've been around, the more authority it gives you to exclude others. It's the kind of sentence which comes out in the church conference. Wasn't like this in my days. It's a kind of sentiment which comes crashing in on progress, which says, I've been here for 40 years and that's not the way we've done it. It may even be the kind of pride which is around as we compare historic denominations with the Johnny-come-latelys on the block. The fact that we have been in historic churches for a long time. And who are these newcomers on the scene who now appear to have new ways of doing things. It may even be the fact that here in Keswick, there are certain types of songs we're not very comfortable with, and we sing them in certain types of ways. And this was not the way we did it 10 or 20 years ago. God has a way of coming along from time to time and pushing us beyond our comfort zone and suggesting to us that really, there is only one Ancient of Days and he doesn't sit comfortably with contenders to that title. If he is going to extend his family, if he is going to do his business and extend his kingdom, he may well push us beyond the place we are most comfortable. There is an unwritten doctrine too for many of us, not just so much of precedence, but of preference. We just don't like things in a certain way. We just don't like the way they do things. One of the most difficult things about ecumenical type affairs or uh, unity type events is the way in which we are thrown together to cross pollinate across our different evangelical cultures. And one of the telltale signs of that, as I was just hinting a while ago, is very often even the way in which we do worship. We just prefer things in a different way. And I believe one of the great challenges of the times for us in the body of Christ is to recognize that there may be no problem with the way I like to do things, but God may just have other people who do things in a different way. And although we have a preference for what God might do and how God might behave, that others out there have a different way of doing things, and being different doesn't mean necessarily being wrong. It was an enormous challenge for the body of Jesus, as we see globally the fact 
that the power base between north and south, east and west, is changing rapidly. What does it mean now for evangelicalism worldwide to take into account the fact that, as Kwame Bediako, a black theologian from Kenya once said, 53% of the world's Christian population is now non-white. Therefore, he said, for the first time, we can probably say Christianity really is a global religion. Argue with that as you may. But what happens when the eunuch witnesses to Philip? I was, uh, I was uh, uh, talking with Ian Coffey. That took a little while, didn't it, that one? <laughs> I was talking with Ian Coffey um, a little while back, and he was mentioning a trip to Uganda recently when he said he was just flabbergasted to have, to have been in a church in Uganda, bulging at the seams, and they have sent out, their passion is to send out something like 200 missionaries, where? To Britain. <laughs> what happens when God begins to send in people from Latin America, from Asia, and to bring us different ways of being church and doing church and seeing the purposes of God fulfilled? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, God will sometimes push us past our preferential zones. And there's no harm, there's no difficulty in having preferences. The problem is when we say that uh, somebody else is disqualified because of theirs. How about prejudice? That's three Ps if you're writing notes. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not even a Baptist. <laughs> not even a Baptist. Uh, People have all kinds of prejudices. This means, of course, prejudging other people. Usually, it's more comfortable at a distance. When I went to London Bible College uh, many moons ago, this was 1972, I don't think I recognized just how deeply prejudicial I was. Uh, I, I, I'm a Pentecostal. I go to a black majority Pentecostal church, New Testament Church of God. The true church. Uh, um, well, you may laugh, but we're the only ones who guarantee your money back. <laughs> the, um, pillar and ground of the truth. Pentecostal, 1970s. The white folks were only just getting their minds around the Holy Spirit, I thought. They were just getting into using guitars and drums in church, way behind us. Uh, the preachers were okay. I, I kind of knew that if you, were, if you were a Baptist, you may be all right, because you baptized like we did. Um, we weren't sure about Methodists. We didn't think they were clear as to whether they were, were Anglicans or not. Um, Anglicans were off the map, totally. <laughs> they, they just didn't count. Um, and, and even the white Pentecostals, we weren't sure about. They didn't preach as long. They... <laughs> They didn't clap properly. It was, it was terrible. Um, so I knew I, I belonged to the true church, you see. Uh, and I wouldn't have said it, because I'm not even sure I would have been able to articulate it in this way. But I'm sure there was a kind of a prejudice in my mind, my attitude. I was polite. I was very accommodating to everybody else. God had to batter on my prejudice and tell me that he had more friends in his front room than I thought he was allowed to keep. <laughs> but there were people who did things differently than me. They dressed differently. They went to places I didn't think Christians went to even. But some of them actually loved Jesus, and they were a part of the family. I pray, said Jesus, not for them alone. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to suggest to you that if you have been incredibly comfortable in your Christian experience for the last 30 years and you have known no discomfort as you seek to find what God is doing in the wider world, that probably you have missed something slightly because I'm finding out just about every week of my life and work that God keeps pushing us beyond our comfort zones. I pray that you will bring to us those who will believe in me through their message. I've been thinking about that quite a bit because this reveals a very important tension we have in the body of Christ. 
Actually, when you look at this text, it is profoundly relational. I don't know if you've ever thought about it in, these, in, in this way. Um, uh, let me just try this on you. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave to me that they may be one as we are one. And so it goes, it's incredibly relational. Jesus prays a prayer here, which is a relational prayer. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. How do we keep that tension as people who are Bible believers? Surely we're just into relationships, in unity. We don't really need to make too much of a distinction between the message and Jesus. Well, of course we do. Of course our unity has to be predicated on some theological distinctives. Of course, biblical truth is important. Of course, it is important to ask profound questions like, what is an evangelical? And we cannot afford to run roughshod over theological distinctions. The message we preach is important. And I have to say, as we move on to the new religion of tolerance, which is seeking to uh, 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 get rid of all lines of demarcation, a new culture of acceptance and accommodation and political correctness, which is having a profound impact on the body of Jesus. In fact, my theory is that in the years to come, evangelical fragmentation may not come about because we are fighting doctrine. Evangelical fragmentation may actually happen because we become theologically indifferent. That it really doesn't matter what you believe. That it really doesn't matter where you go to church, or if you go to church, or how long the preacher preaches if he preaches to you when you go to church. That there is, in a sense, a growing culture of tolerance, which would suggest to us that to be anyone of conviction within the body of Jesus and to wear the label evangelical becomes a liability in a culture which is seeking to free itself from labels and definitions and orthodox constraints, and let's just go with the flow and all will be well. I believe that's going to be an incredibly difficult challenge in the years ahead. And the task we have in the work I do in the Evangelical Alliance, a task many of you do is you preach and attempt faithfully Sunday after Sunday, midweek, uh, in house groups and so on, to present a credible word defined by an understanding that the Bible is God's revealed word for us today. That challenge will intensify. Grant you that. But we still have to say that the message is not Jesus. That what we preach is not in and of itself Jesus. There's an African proverb which says this, I point you to the moon and you see my finger. I've heard many uh, uh, sermons uh, and attempts to talk about uh, gospel church. I think that's right. But uh, so long as uh, gospel doesn't necessarily mean uh, an overlay of all the things I hold historically, which then separates me from you and legitimizes my exclusion of you along the terms of reference I have determined by myself or with others of like mind. And there is a huge tension here. To be faithful to truth and yet not discard the person of Jesus. For the primary task of the preacher and the primary task of the church and the forum of legitimate, authentic, biblical unity is not what we preach, 
but Jesus himself. Extraordinarily difficult to keep in balance because we're not existentialists. We're not relativists. We don't go off in some kind of subjective, mushy understanding of a, a wonderful, gooey Jesus we just embed ourselves in and don't ask any theological questions. That's not how Paul understood it. 164 times and more, he used this description, we are in Christ. That is, ladies and gentlemen, a biblical experientialism, a biblical expression of our togetherness in Jesus, which does no violence to scripture or doctrine. The challenge is how we embrace the two, and the challenge is to make sure that we don't exalt the word we preach and the way we handle the Bible even above the person of Jesus himself. There was a little problem I have with evangelicalism from time to time. And it's this, that we are great on doctrine. We love it. And we're so much into it that we want to win the argument. If we get into a conversation with other evangelicals, other Bible-believing Christians, we want to win the war. We want to win the argument. Put us in a dispute in a locked room, and our first priority is not to win the heart of our brother or sister. It's to bash them. It's to make sure our doctrine stands supreme above theirs, and we couldn't care less if we destroyed somebody in the process. Now listen, I'm talking from experience. I have some letters I can show you. Jesus said, I pray for all those who will believe in me through their message. The message is the vehicle. It has to be authenticated as we diligently search scripture. But the point is Jesus. And if doctrine gets in the way of the person of Jesus, we've still missed it. Dostoevsky once said something rather provocative. If anyone proved to me, he said, that Christ was outside the truth, then I would prefer to remain with Christ than the truth. That's a bit deep, isn't it? And we know that in the scriptures there is no essential breach between Jesus, the truth, and the word of God, which is true. But when I stand to preach on a Sunday, when I argue with you on a Wednesday, when I speak to the media, the main objective is not to win the argument. It is to make Jesus known and loved. You just heard from Keith about the work we do in the media from time to time. The thing which scares me most is this. It's, it's not the person interviewing me. You know what's, you know what's often behind my mind? And the thing which holds mild terror for me, if it exists, it, yeah, it's probably goofing on a question. That's bad enough. What, what happens to me when I get off the set and head home is now, what did I say wrong? Who's going to get me? <laughs> Who will write me that letter in green ink at a funny angle which comes to my office next week? Who's going to telephone my colleagues on the reception or the information to complain about what that Reverend Edwards didn't say? Often didn't say. When really the task is this. Let's make Jesus known. If there is to be dynamic unity of the body of Jesus, it will be as we take care to do doctrine well. But beyond that, it will be as we live out our lives together in Jesus. Yes, yes, it will be tough. It is already hard. <coughs> Easy enough, isn't it, with 12 people? How do we do it now with so many of us, a million evangelicals in the evangelical alliance, more beyond who wouldn't touch us with a barge pole, and more beyond that who will name the name of Jesus and don't want to parade under the big E of evangelicalism. And, ladies and gentlemen, what do you do? with an evangelical Catholic if you find one. 
Where is all this taking us? The person of Jesus must be the center point, the rallying point of our unity as we move into the future. I was talking with a very wise man, Bishop Murray. Bishop Murray belongs or belonged uh, to the Church of God of Prophecy, he probably still does, but then he was the, the international uh, supervisor, the international pastor for the Church of God of Prophecy. That's a very little interest to you because you don't come from my neck of the woods, but let me tell you that the Church of God of Prophecy is a historic sister body to, to my tribe, New Testament Church of God. And hitherto, the two just hadn't met. We, we sort of skirted around each other um, because we had one reading of history and they had a slightly different reading of history and histrionics kind of got in the way of our relationship very often. Anyway, there I was, stood in Bishop Murray's office in the US of A, and we were talking about relationships and we were talking about uh, tensions and we were talking about Jesus. And he said something which uh, I found very helpful. He said, uh, imagine, he said, that we are in a triangle. At the top, there is Jesus. At the base of either side of the triangle, there is you and me. We will see the world very differently, he said, but as we come closer to Jesus, he said, we probably stand a better chance of hearing one another. Now, the only wrong thing about that is that I wish I had said it first, because it's... <laughs> it pains me to have to credit that every time I say it. Very, very painful. I think there's something in that. I'm praying for those who will believe in me through their message, that they may all be one, Father, just as you are in me, I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. Glory comes into the equation next. Because Jesus said, uh, not only do we want to move them out of their comfort zone, and we pray for those beyond this crowd of 12, uh, and we want these people to believe in me through their message, now he prays, that they may be one. In, in fact, verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me so that we may be one. I, I had never really thought about that until uh, a colleague of mine pointed it out to me. That the unity of the body of Jesus may be supported and affirmed and undergirded by glory. Glory is a funny word, uh, which is very hard to get hold of, isn't it? And the concept of glory comes again and again in this text. You probably didn't notice it, but it comes about nine times in this chapter. It's always talking about glory. Uh, uh, the glory, and the glory, he said, verse 10 of the same chapter, has come to me through them. Stupendous. Glory has come to me through them. This glory is the, the numinous factor. It's, it's the weight of God's presence. It is something about the, the experienced reality of the almighty God which impinges on our existence in such a way that our senses understand the presence of God even though our minds may not be able entirely to assimilate this weight of God's presence. Glory is that extra bit of God's presence which does no violence to the scriptures but which takes us beyond an encounter with God which can only be described in terms of glory. Changed from glory into glory till in heaven we take our places worsely suggested. And this glory is a part of the equation. Because there is something about the immediacy of the power of God which draws us together and puts everything else in its proper perspective. Let me say that some of the arguments which exist right now in this room tent, may only be fixed by glory. Do you know what happened in Azusa Street? at the beginning of the last century, from 1906 to 1909, three services every day for three years. Led by a little black man with one eye, I thought I'd get that in. 
and, and glory where blacks and whites met in what was called the Azusa Street Revival. The first uh, Pentecostal historian, a man called Frank Bartleman, wrote this, the color line was washed away by the blood of Christ. <clears throat> we soon did our best to redraw it, mind you. <laughs> but it was washed away. Why? <clears throat> because for a few years, in ways as yet inexplicable, God showed up and fixed relationships and built church in a way which could never have been organized in any PCC, any synod, any committee, any conference or convention. In ways which even the hearing of a Bible text may not have done. God coming in. Well, I've seen this again and again. People who had a fuss and bother, something about the numinous factor of God's presence just suddenly made it seem like nothing. It just paled into insignificance. Now, I don't know what you made of the Toronto phenomena. Everybody remember the Toronto thing? <laughs> Toronto blessing. I have to say phenomena because, phenomena because I'm an objective person. <laughs> but... Uh, I'm not quite sure what that was all about to some extent. But let me tell you, um, did you ever, ever hear about my research in the Toronto phenomena? You, you probably don't want to hear it anyway. Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, you know, we had four different responses to this. We, felt, we found people who um, were just convinced that the Toronto thing was absolutely demonic. They wouldn't, wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. Uh, and then there were those in our research who were agnostic. They sat on the fence of the Gamaliel School. You saw the fence mark on their bums when they rose to worship. Uh, <laughs> then there was a third group who were really glad for the Toronto phenomenon. It had changed their marriage, their Bible reading, everything was just transformed. But we did find a fourth group of people um, who were just glad for the Toronto uh, blessing because before that, everybody thought they were strange. But then, <laughs> that was right. Actually, I tell a lie. We found, we found a fifth group, and you won't believe this, but we actually, we actually found some people who thought that Toronto was a place in Canada. Can you, can you cope with that? Anyway, I digress. I digress. Uh, whatever you make of it, and I'm not making any value judgments here, the one thing I, I heard from a group of ministers were, was that uh, two, two sets of, of, of leaders who were at loggerheads, really just not seeing eye to eye, met. And during that time, even with outside of this phenomenon or description, God showed up in such a powerful way that they put behind them all the stuff of the past. Is it possible that maybe the hard work you and I are doing in the local church, in our marriage, the people we just cannot see eye to eye with, where there is such an intransigence that we will never rationalize our differences. That maybe what might make the difference in the body of Christ domestically, locally, regionally, internationally, may be the extent to which the glory of God is allowed to be a part of our lifestyle and worship. Jesus said, how will you hold this motley band of men together? Everything from Matthew to Simon, the zealot. Let them have your glory. The glory that you gave me, that they may be one. I in them, you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them. Somebody said about... Uh, half an hour or so ago that I was talking on unity with purpose. It's true. It's just that I've been rather undisciplined and I should have gotten here 10 minutes ago. So let me give you an abbreviated version of the punchline. Uh, unity is not an end in itself. It never has been. It has a missiological focus. Twice Jesus said, I want them to be in harmony so that the world may believe you sent me. Verse 21. Verse 
23. Let the world know that you sent me. Uh, God hasn't called us to, to enjoy a nice holy huddle. To strain for unity for its own sake. That turns out to be the lowest common denominator. That turns out to be survivalism. That turns out to be rather desperate. I remember being introduced at the beginning of uh, last year by someone who said, uh, we're very happy to have Joel Ez with us tonight. He's a very important man. Uh, Joel's job is to keep this diverse group of evangelicals together. Evangelicalism is really diverse, very tough, very awkward. Joel's job is to keep this very difficult group of people together. And he went on like that for about two minutes. That was my intro. I was sort of sagging. And then about a week later, I met, um, I was in the middle of an evangelical, uh, what's the word, uh, punch-up. <laughs> and uh, at, the end of, at the end of this long telephone call, this gentleman said, anyway, Joel, I'm praying for you guys in the evangelical alliance because you do a brilliant job. I said, oh, thank you very much. He said, I wouldn't have your job for all the tea in China, which is a lot of tea. So I said, well, it's not that bad all the time, you know. It does have its brighter moments. And he said, ha, huh, I'd like to know what that is. And then I met a bishop who said to me, Joel, my job's tough, but yours must be ten times harder than mine. And I thought, it's the bishop talking to me. No, uh, I don't think God has called me to stop evangelicals behaving badly. <laughs> don't, I don't think that's my calling. And I think unity is too important to be wasted on Christians. <laughs> Make them one in this fragmented world we live in. In this world where diversity is the buzzword and it's just a synonym for let's do things differently and be identified by our camps. Make them one so that there is a counterculture of people who are different but the same. They are all one in Christ Jesus, but they come from different places, different backgrounds, different cultures, different denominational preferences. Somehow they are held together by a dynamic unity of purpose which holds them. When our unity is about a mission for the world, it does something to the cause of missions. It puts our arguments in secondary place. It puts the purpose for our being together in a more glorious place than surviving another joint worship with somebody scratching away at a guitar louder than you would prefer. <laughs> Somehow it elevates the effort we put into unity. And it is an effort. Paul said it would be, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because there is mission. Lord, I want you to make them one, that the world may know you sent them. That's the first part of the mission. And if we had time, we would elaborate on that. Because you see, he hasn't called us to survive as a holy huddle, even if we are having great times of revival and refreshing and renewal and full churches. That's not the point. Neither is he calling us to survive if we're just about hanging on with four members and wondering how long our building will be opened. He is calling us to be together for purpose, to make Jesus known and loved. And he's calling us for another great mission. And this is the heartbeat I would want to send you away with. I didn't notice this. I had read this text again and again and again, and I never noticed to let the world know that you sent me and loved them. Look, there's never been a time when the church has been so rubbished as now. It's so bad that even some church people rubbish the church. We get dragged through the gutters of the tabloid press for fun. We are misrepresented, misquoted too often. And most of us, most of it we have brought in ourselves. That's the truth of the matter. And the church is no longer seen as a glorious church aspiring to do the purpose of the master. We're very often seen caricatured. That will always be the case, by the way. We'll never escape that. But when the church begins to internalize its own negative press and believes it, we're really in trouble. Mr. Alex Ross, I heard on this very platform some years ago say that the church is a little bit like Noah's Ark. A bit smelly on the inside, but still a lot safer than outside. 
I want you to be blessed by that. <laughs> because the church is still God's best idea for a transformed life or a transformed street or a transformed community or a transformed nation or a transformed Europe or a transformed world. It is still through the church that God will make known his manifold wisdom to the heavenly realms, Ephesians 3.10. And what Jesus said here is that the purpose of the unity is twofold. It is one to make Jesus know, to make others know that God sent Jesus. But also as they look in upon our unity, there will be something so powerfully countercultural that others outside who may not understand our theological distinctions and may not understand our ecclesiologies and the arguments about ordination and the arguments about section 28 may look inside the life of the church with all of its imperfections and see that here is a people God loves. And to make them say, I want to be a part of that. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word, which gives life and light. Pray for anything we've left out unhelpfully, which may have been required for the evening, but I ask you that every word said would be distributed by your spirit to our hearts, but more importantly, to our lives and our actions. And I pray, Lord, as you bind us together in the unity of the body, so may we, in your glory, through your word, and through the Lord Jesus' life and death and resurrection, be your people of purpose in your world for these times. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.